Welcome to our lecture on data collection design principles. We're going to look at good principles of design, principles of good design. These apply to both a data collection instrument and to the database itself. Essentially, what we are trying to discuss are ways to effectively capture the data and reduce errors. And you will see these going kind of moving back and forth between the data collection instrument and the database itself. The primary things that you need to be certain of is that you are collecting all the data that is required per protocol. You have to have that data so that when you get to the end of the study, you can actually analyze it. Uh, you need to avoid collecting unneeded data. It can be really tempting to say, oh, I'd love to know about this patient's smoking habits. Maybe I can fit this question in here. Well, two things. Uh, it's not adding to your analysis and it's not ethical to do that. When you set the protocol up, that is what is approved by your ethics committee and is what is approved by the regulatory authorities, and it's what the patient signs their consent form on. So you can't go back after that approval and after that consent uh, and, and start to just collect additional data. If you really need that data, you have to go all the way back through the cycle. You have to amend your protocol. It has to be approved by the, um, by the regulatory agency and the ethics board, and the patient might have to reconsent as well. So try not to collect any unneeded data and definitely don't collect anything that is not in the protocol. You want to make sure your data is in a usable format because you need to analyze it at the end. You want to make sure your data is collected consistently. You want to avoid free text, avoid duplicating data, and you want to reduce the possibility of missing or ambiguous data. And you have to determine if you're going to collect your data at each visit or if you're going to use running or log forms to update the data at every visit. Let's look at some examples. So here we're looking at formatting. And um, when I say that you need to have a consistent format, you want the way that you capture the data, the field structure the, and the field naming and the attributes to be consistent within a form and across forms where appropriate. Here's an example. One of my favorites is dates. Look at all the different ways you could collect a date. You can collect the date as numerics. You can collect it as an alpha. You can collect it as um, month, day, year. You could collect it as day, month, year. If you are a study coordinator and we constantly collect this in a different format, you're going to start to make errors. And eventually they're going to, there's going to be a point where you're going to enter it in month, day, year when it should have been day, year, month because you get confused and you can't get into a consistent rhythm. The other great thing that happens when you use a consistent format is it reduces all of your programming time and reduces possible programming errors because you can set up standard programs that know that you will always get the date in this format and you don't have to redefine that for every field. So it's a great, great help. Avoiding free text. So first, let's say, what is free text? And essentially, it's like a comment. Here's an example over here we are looking at the general appearance not within normal limits and we want details so we've helpfully typed in some information that says the patient's pale and sweating and their fingers are swollen um, this is great information but you can't actually analyze that you you can't look at that one form and and determine uh, you know i think this patient i think they're saying they have a fever they're pale they have a rash their fingers are swollen maybe some edema how do i represent that statistically how do i compare that to other patients so free text is very difficult to quantify and analyze and plus you have to take the time to enter it that's not quick and if you want to verify it or double check it's correct it's very hard to look at this information and and compare that to another source document and quickly say whether it's right or wrong you sometimes need free text and usually it is used for descriptions of adverse events uh, concomitant medications, diseases. However, what we do is that we then take that free text and we assign it a numeric code based on common 
coding dictionaries. And later in the, the um, course, we're gonna talk about different coding dictionaries that are out there. But essentially what they would do is they would so assign a code that's you could say um, this code means that somebody had a rash and then you can count all the numbers of times that code appears so you can say all of the patients that had a rash in the study and now suddenly you can quantify and analyze that but avoid free text it really should only be used if you are trying to collect information about say adverse events maybe con meds maybe some indications avoid duplication uh, collect your unique data, collect it once and only once, and again, don't ask the sites to do a lot of manual calculations. So here are examples of the bad way to do it. We collected the patient's date of birth, and then we're asking the site staff to say what their age is. We don't need to do that. We can collect it one time here as the date of birth, and then we can use a program to calculate it. Uh, same thing down here. It's another example of bad design. We ask for the number of pills dispensed and the number taken, and then we're trying to ask the study coordinator to calculate the difference between the two. In reality, it makes a lot more sense to collect these two bits of information and then have a program calculate it. Try to reduce missing or ambiguous data. There's a couple of ways you can do that. Prompt the site document events, and this will help you reduce queries. So what do I mean by prompt the site and document events? Let's look over here. We are asking whether the patient came in for visit one, and we are telling the site with a prompt here that if the, they say yes, they need to complete all the visit one forms. We're also prompting the site by requiring a response. They cannot skip this they have to say yes or no. Well, why does that matter? If we just have a blank form, we don't know if the patient came in, but the site forgot to enter the rest of the data. If the site says, no, they didn't come in for the visit, it's no longer ambiguous. We know they didn't come in. We know there's no data for visit one. If they say yes, we know they did come in and they have to enter that data. Same thing down here for adverse events and concomitant medications. We're saying, did they have a breakthrough bleeding event or not? Say no or yes. If they had a um, new adverse event or a change since their last visit, you have to respond to this. See here, I've had the must provide value. So use prompting information. Try to get simple questions answered that let you know what happened at the site, and this will help you reduce queries and reduce missing data. Finally, we're going to talk about this concept of per visit versus running log forms. When we were looking at, um, when we look at schedule of events, we notice that some things occur at every visit and some things only occur once. And a good example is an informed consent. That should only occur one time in a study. And uh, you'll have that form at a, usually your screening visit. After that, you typically won't have another form, in, another in, in, informed consent, unless you update your protocol. Other assessments need to be done at every visit. And a good example of that is concomitant medication log. So you have two approaches. If you are a study coordinator, each time the patient comes in, you could say, did you have a medication? Any medications? Are you on anything? And you could enter all the information for it and save that record. And the next time they come in, you could say, do you have any medications? And they'd say, yeah, I'm still on that medication. And you fill your record out again and you save it. The problem with that is at the end of the study, you have five or six discrete forms describing that same medication, and you have to collapse them all down into one. Instead, what we like to do now is we do what we call a running or log form. So you do your first entry when the patient comes in and they tell you that they what, the, what drug they're on, the indication, the dose, and if they're still on it, then they don't, um, they don't put an end date in there. They just put the start date. And when they come in at the next visit, you go, oh, you know, how's your medication going? Are you still on that? And if they say, no, I stopped, you enter the end date. And if they say, yep, I'm still on it, you ask them at the next visit. So think about whether your data needs to have a form per visit or if it needs to be collected across visits and you need a running or log form.